Do you guys remember those books? It's called like How Stuff Works. And it would like. Oh, yeah. I love those books. I love those books. And you would like deconstruct like a motorcycle engine. And you're like, oh, that's intriguing. Or like a telescope. And you're like, I'm never going to make that. But like that's kind of cool how that like I understand like the mechanics of it. And I think with business, if you understand some of the mechanics, you're like, well, like in general, if I'm making a combustible engine, I need a spark plug. So like, you know, like if my (laughs) idea doesn't like if my idea doesn't have a spark plug, like just abandon it. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain, your podcast for how to grow in counterintuitive ways. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan. But today we have a special guest. Sam Parr is in the house. Sam Parr is the founder of The Hustle. He is the co-host of My First Million, one of the most successful podcasts in the business podcasting space and on the HubSpot Podcasting Network. And the reason Sam is here today is because he is an idea generation machine. Every hour, every minute I spend with Sam, he's always spitting ideas at me. I get random slacks from Sam with different (laughs) ideas or vetting ideas, like kind of constantly. And I think that's something that companies struggle with. So Sam, we wanted to have you on the show today to get deep into idea generation and how you are basically always throwing out ideas to everybody in your world. Kip, I actually use HubSpot like for all of my like little side projects and everything. So for the people listening, HubSpot gives us enterprise access and I've been using it constantly, just like tinkering. It's so fun to use. And I've got like all these ideas. I'm like, why doesn't this exist? And I have to like prevent myself from like asking you all these questions. (laughs) Before we get started, Kieran and Sam, I want to start off with kind of what I think is a controversial take. Like if you read Twitter today, if you read popular business culture, you hear everybody being like, oh, ideas don't matter. Ideas are cheap. It's how how you execute your ideas that really matter. And I think that's just like total bullshit. Candidly, I think you can waste a lifetime, waste years working on bad and mediocre ideas. I think the idea actually matters a lot, especially in marketing when you're looking to be different and have like a real ex exponential or asymmetric return on your work. And I think the notion of like picking the right idea is actually way more important than people think. I think there's like two categories of people. There's people who do stuff and there's people who talk about stuff. (laughs) Yes, go. And my Twitter handle or my inbox, both Twitter, TikTok now and Instagram are like I get like 100 to 200 DMs a day. And it's like, hey, I'm going to launch this, this and this. What do you think about this? And my reply to them is always the same thing. Awesome. Send me the link when it's live. And very rarely do people reply. I don't even read their idea. I'm like, it it doesn't matter. Just send me the link when it's live. And so if you're the type of person who talks and doesn't do, I think ideas are irrelevant because I think you have to get reps Mm. in because creating stuff like I I call it manifesting, which is kind of woo. -woo, I get it. But like taking (laughs) like turning what's in your brain into something that you could see and touch or on the Internet, like read. That is a skill. And if you don't already have that skill of doing, ideas don't matter. If you do have the skill of doing, which I would say all three of us have that, I I think um, ideas do matter because if you are trying to build something that grows quickly, you don't want to put yourself down the wrong path. And one, two or three degrees in the wrong direction for a rocket early on can have like relatively big implications later on. And the person who taught me this was this guy named Kevin Ryan. Do you guys know who Kevin Ryan is? No. Most people don't, but you'll know a lot of his work. So Kevin Ryan's this guy who was the 20th employee at the company that started that originally was AdSense. What's that called? Double double click. Double click. Double click. click. Yeah. Yeah. So he like helped start that. And eventually he worked his way up. I mean, there were only 20 people, but he became CEO of AdSense, you know, Mm. double click. And then it was acquired. And so it was this like huge thing. So he's like was successful there. Then he went on to do this thing where he would fund. uh, He would have ideas. Him and his partner, Dwight, they would have ideas. And they would fund it with $300,000. I think he made $10 million uh, after the double click deal. He told me he would take $300,000 and fund like five ideas a year. And he would let it roll and see what happens. And then if it works, he would help them raise money and hire CEOs. Well, the companies that came out of that are MongoDB, which is like a 15 or $20 billion database company, I guess is publicly traded. The other one was Business Insider. The other one no, was no. Guilt, like Guilt Group, like the I yep. think it's the women's clothes. Uh, it didn't work out, but it was like pretty big for a little while. Another one was Zola, which is like a wedding registry yep. business that's quite big. What else was he had like three more that like you guys would probably heard of. Anyway, 
he told me, he goes, I, ideas are really important for guys like me who do stuff because, and I only have like two good ideas a year. And that's what he told me. And I was like, oh, you're right. Ideas are good. And he's like, the only reason. And I was like, well, Kevin, why do you raise all this money for these businesses when you already have enough money? He goes, two reasons. One, if my ideas are good enough, then they, I should raise money for them because I'm pretty good with ideas. And the right ideas are actually wonderful. And number two, if I do a good job and pick the right idea, I should be building a cash machine where you put $1 into it and it makes $2 or more than $1. And if you have a machine that prints cash, when you input a little bit of cash, what do you do? You just get a dump truck and you dump the money into that machine. <laughs> and so anyway, he was the guy who like inspired me of like, oh, ideas actually are important for a certain group of people. So that's my long, my long answer. So first of all, you made the perfect Venn diagram for Dharmesh's new community, right? Like people who do, <laughs> people who have ideas and then people who do shit and then somewhere in the middle. But one thing would, which would be a good kind of debate to have is, is it the idea that matters or the ability to validate ideas very quickly in that, like, can you have like nine bad ideas and one good idea? But if you're really good at validating ideas, you're going to be much more successful than the person who's waiting on the perfect idea. I think about this a lot in terms of like investing, like investments that you're like very committed to and you have really good theses about it and you know, there's a real reason you want to invest versus like spreading yourself across many investments and hoping like one or two of them actually prove out to be the company that make you a ton of money back. Yes. I think the answer is yes. The only difference is, unlike investing, you have to do it really quickly and you have to start seeing patterns much faster because if I'm making right. something, I'm going to spend hours of my life doing it and like I don't have the time to like waste my life on like losing ideas. And so I've got to get pretty quick at honing in on them and then like just adapting quickly and seeing patterns as to what's interesting and what's not interesting. I, I, I used to say that like, have you, do you guys remember those books? Like it's called like how stuff works and it would like Oh yeah, I love those books. I love those books. And you would like deconstruct like a motorcycle engine and you're like, oh, that's intriguing. Or like a telescope. And you're like, I'm never gonna make that, but like that's kind of cool how that like I understand like the mechanics of it. And I think with business, if you understand some of the mechanics, you're like, well, like in general, uh, if I'm making a combustible engine, I need a spark plug. So like you know, like if my (laughs) idea doesn't like if my idea doesn't have a spark plug, like just abandon it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to like reinvent that part. You know what I'm saying? And so I try to find like patterns where it's like, I just, I know that it, it's like a, it's like a good song. It's like, well, I know like most every good song has like a chorus, a, an interesting melody that is like one of like 30 different chord structures and like a bridge, you know what I mean? Or has like all these like yeah. components. It's like, well, like I don't need to like reinvent the structure of a song, but I could add like my texture within those rules. Yeah. You're, you're like, you need to validate the structure and the components of an idea to see if it's like, viable is kind of, I think, the point that you're making here. The other thing I want to touch on with you, Sam, is because I've been on the receiving end of this. So we're going to take people kind of behind the scenes of how Sam works. People listening are going to be like, how the hell does Sam meet all these people like the, the Kevin Ryans of the world? And how does he also use them to validate his idea. You have, you, you build this network and then you ping people in the network. Like I, I'll get slacks from you and be like, yo, what's, what's your take on this? No context, but like, <laughs> what's your take? And I, I'm like, I'll, I'll slack, I'll slack Sam back like three, like a paragraph. And he's like, thanks. You know? And like, that's his like validation machine, you know? And so like, tell people about like how, how you do this. Cause like, I think you are a, a very expedited learner. You get through these cycles really quickly. And I, I think people want to know how well so like you're the cmo of a huge how, how many i don't even know how many employees hubspot has now many many thousand like four or five seventy five hundred employees seventy five hundred yeah. and hubspot does north of a billion in revenue has all these users has all this data and so you also like help employ seventy five hundred people so i'm like well you have all types of interesting perspective that i definitely do not it like one paragraph from you like there's just so much gold in it. And so I'm so fortunate that I have friends. Well, but you but you have like you have like hundreds of those people in your network. Like, yeah, how did you get them? Like, how does that work? It's not just because you host a podcast like I've been on, into some events with you and everything. And you really focus on building relationships. And I think you should give people some of the cheat sheet on how to do that, because it's actually very, very important. So Kevin Ryan in particular is kind of a good example so I found his email. I think it was like Kevin at, uh, I mean, his email, anyone can guess it. I, whatever the name of his incubator is, I think it's called like Silicon Valley Insider. I don't, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. It was just like his email was just Kevin at. And I just typed in Kevin at on Gmail and just highlighted it. Like, oh, cool. His profile shows up. That must be his email. 
And I sent him literally 30 emails probably before he replied. And I would say like, hey, I'm working on this thing called The Hustle. Here's what it is. It's partially inspired by what you said in Business Insider. Thanks. And I sent that email. And then like a month later, all right, our progress so far is this, this, and this. If you ever have overcome that or if I'm making a mistake, just feel free to let me know. And he like never replied to that. But I kept sending it like five or six or seven. And by the seventh time, he was like, you're on the right track. That's like all he said. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was like, all right, cool, thanks. And then I just sent it again. And like, I just kind of forced myself into his life. And like, he like was like, okay, like this guy. And when I started talking to him, I was 23 or 24. He was like, all right, this person is going somewhere and I'm happy to like follow along. And then occasionally he just gets guilted into like replying. And then I was like, hey, I'm in New York next week. Do you want to hang out? He's like, fine, I've got 30 minutes. I wasn't actually going to New York. I flew just for that. And uh, and so I like would do that all the time. I just cold emailed people like crazy. And now I think I've created a reputation of someone who does stuff and mm -hmm. other doers typically are attracted to that. So like Darmesh is kind of one of Darmesh founder of co-founder of HubSpot, kind of one of my heroes. And because I kind of like also forced myself on him where I was like always talking to him about stuff. He's like, all right, cool. I'll tag along. And then he's like, I'm going to create this Venn diagram website. I'm like, that's the craziest, stupidest, dumbest thing ever. <laughs> and, and it's awesome. And so he'll like start sending me ideas. And, and so anyway, I just kind of like cold emailed people and DM people constantly online. And basically when I was younger, I was like this young kid who they're like, was they were endeared by and they realized I was persistent enough that I wasn't going to go away. And then now I just kind of have developed this reputation and I just cold email people. I just DM people all the time and I don't even ask for anything. I just compliment them. A lot of it is not overthinking things, right? <laughs> yes. That's one of, one of the things I remember the first conversation when, when you joined HubSpot, you're like, oh yeah, I was chatting to Brian, chatting to Darmesh, that you'd been in the company for like three days. I was like, how did you get connected? I just slacked him and said, what's up? <laughs> and, like, and, like, and, then, and then I realized, I was like, oh, there's, he, he probably said, he, he probably said a bunch more things. And then I realized that's what you do do is just you slack what's up <laughs> and, then you just, and you leave it and you leave it there to see what that person says but it's the same way like in terms of ideas one of one of the things struggles i think most people have the, by the way the, the other day jordan who's like the like the president of the hustle or you know like runs the hustle the media in the media group now i message him i go what's up and he called me he goes what's wrong i go <laughs> I was like, nothing. What's up? I just wanted to say what's what, what's going on. I'm thinking yeah. of you. And but isn't it funny like that? That's so alien to people. It's just like, what's up? Like it, everyone, everyone is on a, some sort of like calendar. Everyone has to have a reason to like connect to meet, and like that kind of just freewheeling. Let's like, talk about stuff. Like, how are you doing? Is so the opposite of what we do on day to day. But the other way that that comes out is in, like the way that you validate ideas. I think a lot of us. I think I fall into this bucket sometimes, which is I'll have an idea. And I'm like, okay, well, how can I model out every version of how this yes. idea could go? Like dive into my data, go into my like, computer science background and like try to like model everything and try to de-risk and take all the risk out of it. Whereas you're just like, I'm going to try this. It sounds cool. And then you just go do it, right? I don't think you like you're, I think you're working on something else right now. That sounds really cool. When you have that idea, did you think, okay, where am I going to be in six, six months? Where am I going to be in 12 months? and have like an in-depth model of how you get there? Or like, how, how do you decide what this could become in six to 12 months? Like, how do you decide this is an idea worth pursuing? No, and there's two points. So the reason why you do that, and the reason I do that too, and I fight myself, is because you're afraid. We're afraid. And you trick yourself into thinking yes. that me modeling this out is productive when it's not. It's, mm. it's actually procrastination. Right. And so I, I fight myself from doing that too. And I say, no, like, that's weak. I can't do that. I got to avoid that. And so I like try to avoid it. So I, I kind of like, I, I do that as well. So I kind of like had to like, bully myself into not doing it. But Kevin Ryan actually, again, is the one who kind of taught me. He goes, you just need back of the envelope math. And so like with the hustle, we could use the hustle as an example. I was like, well, this email thing kind of makes sense. Like someone, these five people told me that roughly I can get $25 per 1000 cents for a newsletter if I have a high quality audience. And like, Mm -hmm. People interested in tech and business are high quality. Let's see if I can just get like like a, a 500 of them interested really quick. So I created the thing. I'm like, wow, I got them. Well, uh, Business Insider says that they get 80 million people a month coming to their website who read their tech news. And like there's 380 million Americans. 
are there like a million people interested in this? Yeah, like probably. Therefore, if I can get a million people interested in this and I could charge $25 per 1,000 sends, that's 25 grand per time I hit send times 30 days. I don't know what that math is, but that's around $10 million a year in revenue. And I was like, well, if I could make 10 million in revenue on a business, I bet you I could figure out a way how to make like 50 or 100. Like what would happen? Are there 5 million people? Maybe, but I know there's a million people and I'm pretty confident I could like learn new things along the way. So that's typically how I think about businesses. So I, I do one of, I, I do a few things. The first is I look at like, well, who else out there is in the market? Well, how big are they? Oh, they're a billion dollars in revenue. Okay. I know that it's physically possible that this is a big <laughs> enough idea. Like I, I like, I, I'm not yeah. the first to do it. So like with HubSpot, I actually don't know if there was a billion dollar CRM business uh, when HubSpot started, but like Salesforce was a big business in CRM. Marketing automation was still an uncertain category, but we thought it was transforming enough that we could take advantage of it and that we would eventually get it to CRM. But, but yeah, you thought similar or, math, or, or, but even like originally you're like, well, Salesforce does this. Why can't I do this? Yes. But with a different flavor, totally. like with this, uh, with this one thing. And then like, can we kind of figure it out as we go? Yeah, I think like it's a big enough idea. It's worth defaulting to the, it's big enough to pursue. And then we could kind of figure out along as we go. And so I kind of look at just like the physics of it, of like, just like it, is it physically capable? And then I just do back of the envelope math of like, well, like, can I get them? Can I get like 5 million people to sign up for this? Yeah, I, I kind of think I do if I like give it eight years. And so that's typically like all my math is. It's just like back of the envelope math. And then like, for like any of the projects I have, if I ever partner with people, they're like, hey, let's build the thing. Uh, let's build like a spreadsheet that models this out. And this just happened the other day on this little thing I'm tinkering with. And I was like, dude, no. I do not care. Like everything that you're doing, I just don't care. It's totally meaningless. And it's just not important to me at all. I think that when you get to like 30 or 50 million, I don't know where the number is, but like when you get to some type of like capacity where you have to have like executives helping run things and you need to give them targets, then I understand why you would do that. But I think until you hit some type of like trajectory where it's like we are for certain that this is like somewhat meaningful, you don't need any type of Excel or you don't need any of that crap. And if you do do it, not only do I think you don't need it, I actually think it's going to hurt you. Well, look, this this is my take. This is my very controversial take on this, which is like modeling is just a set, a set of assumptions. And so if you have a big business and you are trying to prevent downside, that's really helpful. You're like, oh, I'm thinking about this change. I don't want to lose a bunch of money. I have all these historical assumptions. Great. If you are trying to maximize upside, modeling is a complete fucking waste of time. You're never going to make the assumptions of like, oh, we can do this crazy thing. You just, you're not. You, the only way to do it is to go out and actually do it. These are the same people who build products in private and don't get people to use them and then just tinker around in their products and they never actually see the light of day because they don't, don't get real feedback and get that product actually good. So can I give you guys, I'm going to give you guys a very specific set of tools that I use to like research. Please. And think, all right. The first one is Companies House. Have you guys heard of Companies House? It's, it's a weird word. You, Co Companies house. I think this was one of the examples I was going to bring up. Like one of the calls that you and I were on, you took me through a bunch of things. And I think this was one of the places you were digging into. And I was like, some of the information that you were pulling was like mind blowing to me. So I think this is one of the places you were showing me. Yeah. All right. I'm going to give you an example. So there's this thing called Companies House. It's in the UK. And basically, yeah. if you are a private company that does north of 20 million in revenue, you have, and you're a privately held company, you have to give a report. And it could be even 10 million in revenue. I think it's 20 though. You have to report all your income. Mm -hmm. And so basically you have to have an income statement for a privately held company. And you could, and it's all free. Anyone could just log on. You just Google Companies House and you could log on. So for example, I was just doing some research on the VPN, uh, VPN business. Why? I don't know. Because I went to like, <laughs> I, Googled, I Googled like best <laughs> VPN and I saw like, all these VPN reviewing websites. And I like scroll down to the bottom to see who owns them. And I noticed that I clicked like their corporate page and I was like, oh, wow, this blog on best VPN actually owns like five VPN companies. What the hell? That's kind of weird. Oh, and it says they're located in the UK. You know, whatever. Let's just look this up. And I found this VPN company called Compare Tech. And they were big enough that they were revealing their revenue and they had to report their annual income and all that stuff. And I realized that this company called Compare Tech was doing 15 million in revenue, 13 million in profit. And so basically <laughs> they had this VPN company that was run by like three or four people. 
with close to no marketing costs because they own these best review or these own these like VPN review sites and they were just killing it. And then I found out that like six months after I started researching it, they were acquired for like one hundred and fifty million dollars. Wow. And I was like, that's crazy. Wow. This VPN business is crazy. This is so interesting. And that like <laughs> I'm not going to launch a VPN company, but kind of taught me that like, wow, getting search traffic for like an up and coming market like could be the key to like unlocking some of these like things and like VPN it must be like a commodity because if they only have like five or six people, they're probably not developing and innovating that interestingly. And so anyway, yeah. that's a resource I use is company house. Another resource that I use constantly that I have bugged Kip about in order to, I'm like, dude, give me a, give me a, a, a password to this login is a similar web. Yeah. Yes. So yes. I have a plugin the similar web plugin. And anytime I go to an interesting website, I look at three things or four things. I look at how much is their traffic and similar web for those listening. It's a website that guesses traffic. It's frankly not that accurate. So any type of traffic you see, you can divide by two or multiply by two or even divide by three and multiply by three. But it's just a benchmark. And it's just like it yeah. just it, it, I use it's the, directionally right. It's directionally right. right. I just use it to find signals. And so I look at what's their traffic, anything above Three million monthly visitors on similar web. I'm like, oh, that's kind of intriguing. I look at what their mm -hmm. source for traffic is. So if it has a lot of direct traffic or search traffic, that's interesting. If it has a lot of social traffic, that's kind of uninteresting. And I look at time spent on site. And then I look at which websites are referring traffic. And so I'm going to give you a very specific example. I read in the news that uh, there was this company called Crunchyroll that was acquired for like a billion dollars. And Crunchyroll was like an anime subscription anim, anime for Netflix. It's a it's a it's an yeah. industry I know nothing about. I don't watch that stuff, whatever. And I was I just like went to similar web and typed in Crunchyroll. And I realized that there was a website that similar web said was similar to Crunchyroll called Lit Rotica. So I'll actually uh send this to you guys so you can see it. So it's called I'll, I'll put it in your uh in the chat here. It's called Please. Lit Lit Rotica. And if you go to this website, Literotica, sorry. If you go to this website, it looks like a website from 1999. It looks like one of the world's <laughs> first does. websites. And their tagline is a free adult community for erotic stories. <laughs> so, so like, I, I never would have, like, This is literally the worst website <laughs> I've ever seen in my <laughs> entire life. So, if you put that website into similar web, they get 60 million monthly views. Which an average oh <laughs> with an average site uh, duration of seventeen minutes, okay. <laughs> so if you get a if you have a website that gets sixty million views, it doesn't matter if you just make money on banner ads and someone is spending seventeen minutes. That's intriguing, and this website's horribly ugly. And I was like, no, I'm see, I'm being serious for everybody listening. It's the worst website I've ever seen. It's it's the worst, and I, but like I was like, oh my gosh, like what is this? And like tell me everything. And so I got really interested in like erotic stories, not because I actually care about basically it's it, literotica from what I understand. I'm just browsing for a little while. It's basically like he's just browsing. Just yeah. browsing it's, like, <laughs> it's like all it's like all text <laughs> stories on like erotic stories, which I assume it's judging off the website. It's mostly read by women and it's like an interesting service, whatever. And so I got curious about this and I go, I want to prove if my research methodology is effective. And so I actually created a website called, uh, what did we call it? I forget what we call that. I think we called it Captivating Claire. Mm -hmm. And I hired a guy on Fiverr to write an erotic story. And then I hired another guy on Fiverr to do an <laughs> audible version of it. And I created a website where you could listen to part one and you could read part one. And then I put a little bit of ads on Facebook and I spent $500 promoting the story. And at the bottom of the website, it said, pay $5 a month to get part two. And then we'll also send you a new part every month. And in one night, I collected $500 on my $500 in ad spend. I had people, <laughs> I had people who signed up for this service and I eventually re refunded them. I'm like, uh, I'm actually like, we, you know, it, it, we didn't mean to launch this or something this like a that. Test, yeah. Yeah. And but I was like, oh my gosh, someone could build a pretty big business doing this. And so I gave it to a trend subscriber. I go, dude, just run this. And he ended up selling it in six months for six months for five hundred thousand dollars. Oh site. my god. He got That's it. To, crazy. He collected like 150,000 revenue and had like a team of like five writers that he met and like was creating this. So my point being is I actually still think that that could be a, a relatively big business, like audible for erotic stories geared towards women. And it was all because I just used similar web and company's house or similar web in this case to find 
what this was. Um, and finally, another really simple, easy source that I use all the time is just annualreports.com. And the reason why I like annual reports is because I'll go to all types of weird websites. Like another one was uh, Tech Target. Have you guys heard of Tech Target? Oh, yeah. So yeah. if you're yeah. not, if you're listening to this, you're into marketing, but you still probably won't even know what Tech Target is. So Tech Target is basically, if you Google like, um, what's a good payroll software or something like that, or even more niche, like it's so niche, I can't even think of a good example. Like what's a, like some type of like super specific software use case for a company with 5,000 employees, you, or, you know, whatever it is, you like see these websites like CIO.com or, mm -hmm. you know, chief information officer.com or like all these things. I'm like, what the heck is this? And I noticed that they were all owned by the same company called tech target. I Googled tech target. I was like, oh wow, they're publicly traded. So I just like go to annualreports.com. I type in tech target. I go to the year that they IPO would and I look at their, what's it called? Like 10 Q or at, what's it called? What's it? 10 K. Well, they're, they're S1. S1. Yeah. S1 is your f filing documents and you have to, you have to file a 10 K every quarter. And you're, they're S1. I go and read their S1 and they say, we tech target, we own, they basically just outline how their business works. They go, we own 31 websites that creates webinars and white papers for different niche executive topics. And then when people give us their information, we give it to lots of providers of the software and they somehow try to sell to that provider. Yeah, they sell and, the leads. Yeah, yeah. And they all, and we collect and our collectively our websites get three million people a month, which is not a lot for a publicly <laughs> a traded lot. company. And we make this much money like per lead. And they just like freaking outline to me, oh, thanks for telling me exactly how this business works. And so <laughs> I do that because it just kind of like convinces my brain of like, oh, this is what's possible with this much traffic. I could do that like if I wanted to. And so anyway, I use andorreports.com. I use similar web and I use companies house. And the final thing that I can mention is, is I love web archive. So any company that yes. I see that is big, I go to webarchive.com and I move the browser or their scroll button or whatever all the way to the first month that they launched. And you can see how they positioned their website. Yes. So if you go to pandora.com, their website originally was like, we create we create software so Best Buy can put music in the CD aisles and you could type in that you like the Beatles and we'll recommend a new CD for you. And I was like, what the hell? That's how they started? And then I'll go Crazy. and like Google Pandora and I'll put the search parameters to like the year they launched. And like, you'll see an article with like the founder saying, we created this thing. So it's a kiosk and every, whatever. And I'm like, oh, sick, cool. You're telling me a story here. And then you start seeing when the iPhone launches, their messaging starts changing. And you see another article of like Pandora is the first app in the in the iPhone app store. And it's a music directory thing. And you start putting together these stories and you start seeing these patterns. And I and I will create like an Excel or like a Google sheet where I put like 1999 launched originally kiosk for Best Buy, you know, 2001. Uh, one of the first apps, 2002, claims 100 million in revenue. Oh, wow. Why? Because they were the first freaking app. They jumped on a platform that was exploding, just like someone could do for TikTok, this thing, whatever, any of these new platforms. And so I start painting these like stories or telling these stories and I can like track all of it. And those are the main four resources that I use. And then I have like eight more, but those are like the four ones where I can like really start seeing patterns and start seeing stories. And then when people are like, you know, I'm thinking about launching this company, this like company that reviews like MailChimp software. And I was like, that's cool. But have you ever thought about doing it for companies that spend this much money on software? There's a company called Tech Target. They do it. I've gone to their websites. I actually think they're missing out here, 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 and here. And then they're like, well, how do you come up with these ideas? I'm like, dude, it's in plain sight. I just freaking read the thing. You just read. You just read. <laughs> read. So anyway, that's my long ranting answer. Hopefully that's <laughs> but, intriguing but, enough. But in all seriousness, people are like, Sam, you're kind of a crazy person probably listening. But Ballpark, how many companies are you running that process on in a month? Five a day. Five a day. Do, I mean, I don't know how many websites you go to a day. Like <laughs> any website that I go to that I haven't, like, like, let's just say that like I need a new mattress. I just go to a mattress company and just while I'm on the website, I'm like, oh, this is intriguing. How much traffic does it get? You know what I mean? <laughs> You're so, obsessed with the business model and how they scale it and like how they got to this idea. And then, then you come up with new ideas and you figure out where they're deficient I, I'm in just, what they currently are we, doing. We talked about that book, How Stuff Works. I'm just uh, every single day I'm making a really like small sketch of how a thing works. Yes, every right. time I buy anything, whether it's this drink Topo Chico or if I like I love Topo, anything that I buy, I have that little 
similar web plugin and I'm just going to click it. I'm like, oh, what, what's, what's this about? It's curiosity as well, right? Like that we talked about this yes. in the podcast that the one of the best skill sets you can have is curiosity. Like you mentioned scroll, like this is all baked in. I'm just curious to learn more about that business where most people would go and they would scroll through things and they wouldn't find the footer link and say, well, all of these sites are owned by this one publication. They would just go do their thing and then move on. And so there's like part curiosity, part obsession. And I'm wondering like for listeners who are, you know, part, you know, some founders, but some exact some marketers like some of the things that actually would help them to apply this to how they do their work is like not obsessed over the model that that is a big thing like especially because data has become such a bigger part of like every company and so part of your job is like forecast the future hey you're going to do this thing tell me the amount of revenue yeah. i get back for this thing and that just constrains you to do the same things we talked about this it, you're just constrained, right? I have to do the same thing as everyone else because I can only measure a certain amount of things. The best things that you could do potentially aren't worth measuring until you've actually done them. And there's that real constraint about like, what is my forecast model? What's this worth to the company? And I think part of what Sam is saying is that doesn't really matter until you've like proven you can actually do the thing. Like start to model it when you've actually yeah. demonstrated there's some there's something there. But but even when it does matter, you still need assumptions for new stuff. Kieran and Kip, you guys were responsible for wanting to buy the hustle. You're like, I need some assumptions. What are some assumptions here? So you still need to use these tools yeah, in order to, to come yeah. up with like, well, is 3% yes. conversion too high? Or is like 1%? Well, let's just go and like research how other people do it and like get, get some type of idea. Yeah, you need a story. Like one of the things you mentioned was you actually, I love the way that you talked about it. Like you put it all into a narrative. Like you're a storyteller, yeah. right? Like the business you sold is storytelling. You're a content creator. You tell stories all the time. It just so happens a lot of the stories you tell are around ideas and business. But you think of everything in terms of a narrative. Like companies started here. They did these things. There was inflection points. And so you still need a story to like sell your idea. Like any idea has to be sold to someone, whether you're selling it to yourself or someone else, or you're selling it to your manager or you're selling it to a, a CEO. But I do think that where we fall down is like we just over complicated right and i think that the best people i've seen at like implementing things like you would be one of them sam and other founders they don't actually over complicate things <laughs> they don't, they're just like this is a really great idea and i'm gonna get some rough things that i need to like figure out what, what i need to do and then i'll just go do it well you know what it's rooted in i think is like it's it's rooted a little bit into confidence and not that i'm confident but more so i know no one else is confident and yes. the reason I know the reason Say I, that again, yeah, it's like, well, it's like, I think I'm kind of good, but I know that everyone else thinks that they're bad. And the reason I know that is because I was lucky enough to host HustleCon. It was our it was the Hustles conference. And we would over the years, we probably had 150 to 200 founders speak collectively at our events. And what I would do is I would tell people if they had to speak at one, I'm like, hey, you got to get here at 11, you know, just for mic check and all that stuff. In reality, mic check takes five minutes. But I would be like, I want to hang out with you, actually. I didn't actually tell them, but I was like, I want you to arrive early. So I'm going to be in the green room with you and like the other five people who said they're going to speak. And I'm just going to listen and hear you guys talk. And so we've had like, I remember distinctly one year in a room, we had Miguel, the founder of WeWork. We had this woman named Payal who started um, ClassPass. ClassPass. Which, yeah. And then we had Casey Neistat. And then it was the, what's the, there's a company that starts with the T, Thread Up. Thread Up, which is like a, mm, a company that sells stuff. I, I think they're on their path to being public. And then we had um, like Zapier, like people like that all in this room. And like one person would complain of like, you know, I have it. I don't know how I think I just like said something to bait them into like talking about sensitive stuff. <laughs> like I was like, uh, I think I said like, you know, I'm afraid of this. Are you afraid of this? And they're like, yeah, I'm afraid of this. In fact, there's one employee who I have that works for me. And I'm afraid to fire them, even though they're incredibly like a bad employee. But like, I've just been afraid of the confrontation for the past two years or another person being like, our model's working, but like, I don't know if it's actually going to be profitable or uh, like, I don't know how we're going to get out of this hole. Or I remember talking, I can talk about this now a little bit because he sold. I remember the athletic founder, you know, they sold New York Times for hundreds of millions of dollars. He's like, it's going great, but man, it's a grind. And like, I don't know like what renewal is going to be. I'm really afraid of like how we're going to like. And I was like, oh, sick. These people I look up to, they're dumb idiots just like me. <laughs> and a, a, a case, it. Yeah. And I'm like, occasionally there's someone who is like multiple standard deviations smarter than me. That right. definitely happens. But in general, everyone is only like a handful of percent smarter or dumber than I am. The difference is, is that they're doing it. And still, they are not confident in a bunch of their decisions. They're just going for it. And so when I saw that, I was like, 
awesome. This is actually a normal feeling to be afraid to do X, Y, and Z. So I, I shouldn't let those feelings get in the way of me doing them. Preach. Well, I guess I, want, I wanted to follow up on that. One of the things the three of us kind of talk about offline sometimes is that companies do really boring stuff. Like the, the vast majority of companies are boring. They're not differentiated. Like, is that because they're afraid? And like what you were just talking about? Or like, what are the root causes for, uh, there are a bunch of people listening that are doing boring things. Even like, I look at the work we're doing at HubSpot, it's like a lot of it's cool, but like some of it, I'm like, ah, that's just like boring and not good enough. Like what's the traps that get you get you there? Brian Halligan, when the, the day or two before or after we closed our deal, Brian <laughs> Halligan, the, former, oh, the, the founder of HubSpot and the former CEO, he called me and he goes, hey, I just wanted to say what's good and what's going on. And I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And I really wanted to tell you one important thing, which is I need you and your company to stay weird. And here's my cell phone number. If anyone ever tries to contain you guys and hold you back from being like odd, call me. <laughs> and I was like, all right, great. And I, I told that to my team after we got acquired because they were all afraid. And, and for the most part, it's been entirely true. And I think I was talking to um, this company that's like a $300 million a year business last, yesterday. They were like, hey, can I ask you some questions about email? I was like, yeah, sure. And they go, we want to create this newsletter because we have all these customers who aren't converting. And I was like, all right, well, here's I, I was like, the hustle realistically could still be only written by two people. It's like a pretty easy, like newsletters aren't that yeah. hard to pull off. And we write every single day. If you're just going to send one day a week, if I was you, what I would do is um, do X, Y, and Z. And I'll tell you what I sell them. But they said, um, great, we're, well, we're, we're going to operationalize this. We're going to do this. I'm like, no. Do not do that with your first starting. <laughs> don't yes. op don't operationalize this yet. One day, yes. When it's working, yes. But don't do that now. And they're like, why? I was like, here's what you need to do. If you're going to create a weekly newsletter for your users, send it to your company, but not even the entire company. I go, how many people work there? They're like 800. I'm like, great. Get 10 of them. You 10, hire one person who you think is competent, and you just have them write a weekly email just to you 10 people. And after three or four weeks, get 30 people. And then after another two or three weeks, add like uh, 50 people, including the CEO or the decision maker, because then they'll be a little bit better. And then um, if they like it, and by the way, even if they don't like it and they complain to you, don't listen to all the feedback. Only listen to a little bit of the feedback yes. because everyone's going to complain about something. And then after a while, maybe a month, two months, three months, then launch it to your users. And they're like, why would you do that? I was like, well, because you're a bigger company. And what's going to happen is you're going to hire this person to do this and she's going to be like embarrassed and fearful and she's going to write in a way that she thinks she's supposed to write not in a way that she thinks that customers truly want and you're setting her up to fail because she's going to be nervous and I don't blame her she's going to get fired you're going to fire her if she sucks or at least that's what she thinks and therefore you have to like somehow set it up in such a way that she feels free to like you know write interesting stuff and like be weird or tr take risk and there should be no consequences because that's what you need early on is to take risks and so anyway, I think a lot of times people, co companies do boring stuff is because they're trying to operationalize things too much too early. Yes. And they aren't empowering their team to look silly. And therefore, it creates a scared employee who's fearful of their job. And I don't and I don't blame them. And so at The Hustle, one thing we always tried to do was like celebrate people trying stuff that didn't work. And we always used to have a phrase where I would say, let your freak flag fly. Like, you know, <laughs> it's OK to like be like like ah you. you know it's yeah. Like, yeah that's good we want that and it's okay to take risks i'm going to tell you if it if it like if it fails we're going to acknowledge it and move on but like you're not in trouble for trying you're not you're not in trouble for swinging and missing but you will be in trouble for not swinging what what's interesting to me is Kieran, I'll kick it to you in a second. It's like this is a bit of a show today about ideas and generating ideas and curiosity it's actually been a show about insecurity and fear Right. Like the core gap to all of the things we just talked about, the reason everybody isn't researching five companies a day and putting stuff out in the public and doing all the things we've talked about is largely just insecurity and fear, not because they're not smart enough, not because they don't have the resources. None of those things are actually blockers. It's really they're just scared of what other people think. They're scared to fail and they don't think they're good enough to do those things. That's like if you're listening, you're good enough. Like I promise you, like well, the three of us have met thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs in our lives. And most of them are not the smartest people. They're just the people who are willing to take a chance. Well, the point of mm. researching is to normalize that. Have you ever heard like the yes. phrase, you're the average of the five people you hang out with most? I believe that to All be true. Time. I also think I'm the average of the five like inputs that I have in me constantly. And if I like figure out, 
oh, I understand how this works. It's not that complicated. You know what I mean? Like if you get that yeah. vibe and energy in you consistently, then it normalizes success and it normalizes trying things. Well, what I love about that is when people are insecure, they try to make their job seem more complex than it actually is. This is, and they try to make you feel like you could never possibly thing. understand this is how the hard thing. their thing is, and that's total bullshit. I know when uh, someone is actually pretty dumb is because I can't understand what they do. Like if someone, if, I, yes. if someone is in a room with me and they're trying to describe like, oh, I'm doing A, B, and C, and I can't understand it, I don't think it's because I, I'm dumb. I think it's because they're dumb, and what they're doing is actually not that hard, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> because like the smartest people you meet, they're like, yeah, I do this thing. You're like, oh, I understand that thing. Yeah, because they, they're they they're able to articulate it and they have the confidence to say yes. it. it's not like a really complicated thing. I remember a friend of mine like going on a tangent somewhat related as like, I used to be like really heavy into the like online affiliate world. Like that's one of the ways I got into digital marketing. That's like back when it was a real murky thing. Like Kieran did real, some sketchy things. Like, ske like sketchy black hat SEO. Every great marketer stuff. did. Start oh, yeah like for sure trying trying to hack the system right and like and uh, I remember a, a, a guy I know bought this site for uh, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands and he went to this conference where all of these like millionaire direct marketers like you've probably heard of it some of the sound that you know Frank Kearns like some of the big copywriters of well yeah so all yeah. of these you you know that you know that kind of industry right it was one of those events and uh, he came back and I was like what well, what was the event like and he goes wow. I met some of the richest, stupidest people I've ever met in my life. And I, and I was like, what do you mean by that? He goes, these people are so stupid that they will do the same thing day in, day out, but it makes them a ton of money and they don't get bored. And that's all he <laughs> stuck with me, which is like, like they don't, they don't overcomplicate things. They're just like, yeah, this makes me money. Why would I do anything different? Even though it's like the same thing every, every day. And I, they just don't overcomplicate it. Like they don't make it more complex than it needs to be. I think that like, uh, the, a lot of the great companies have one foot in like, for example, there's this company called ClickFunnels and they do kind of what HubSpot does. But frankly, their product is inferior, but their marketing and their marketing is pretty like weird and scammy looking, but it like is super effective. And mm -hmm. Russell, the guy who started it, I like him a lot. I actually don't think he's a scam, but like he can they, they come off like that because they're like in that same field, unfortunately, sometimes. And I think it's really important, though, to understand that world and to understand how direct marketing works and understand yeah. how some of these people who yes. yep. startup people typically are like, oh, that's beneath me. It's like, no, they're actually better than you at X, Y and Z. But then you pair it with like the startup world of like oftentimes willing to raise money, but not always, but willingness uh, and then like hiring a, a fairly high caliber person and like focusing on product. If you marry those worlds and understand both of them, you can actually be quite successful. That's where I never, I, I never usually tell people this, but like I meet people or I hire people who like they have MBAs and marketing and all this kind of stuff. I learned marketing on the Warrior Forum. You ever remember I love the Warrior that forum. forum? Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's, that, that's where my, I learned what, marketing. What was the other one called? Fast Lane. <laughs> yeah, I, that's where I learned, like, and in I was in like uh, you know all these kind of like hidden groups where people were like talking about how they would do like weird sales copy and crazy weird search like. No, I'm not advocating not to be used to learn marketing, but I, <laughs> well, it's I, not like a lot of the shit that they do. It's not inherently wrong, and it's so not you, wrong. But you I, should, and, and even if it is wrong, you could still learn from people doing unethical stuff. Yes, and so right. like, but like understanding both of those worlds is actually incredibly effective. Like for example, if you go to Hey.com or you go to anything done by the Basecamp guys, they understand that long form copy typically works right. better than not long form copy, and yes. their websites have it. Although their websites are somewhat prettier than maybe like a whatever these people, whatever the world is called that we're describing. But like it's like a really good example of marrying them both. For example, if you go to Apple and you go look at like the MacBook website or even an amp, go to the Kindle, go look at the sales page for the Kindle. It's long form. It's all it's literally yeah, three or four form. thousand words in some pictures. Right. It's like, well, why are they doing that? Because it's effective. It works. This is what people want versus this like minimalist style. And it's like, man, if your products are new, like you need a ton of words to explain what it's all about. But for some reason, people are they think, oh, no one will read this. It's like, well, a lot of people won't read that. But your conversion rates only one percent anyway. If you want it to be five percent, you just want like a little bit more people to read it. Well, and, and this is this is, I, I think, the kind of close out on the show today. It's like when you think about generating ideas, there's the, the counter of that. And there's a bunch of people out there who don't get ideas because they one, they either think they know it all or they're just chasing the new thing. Some of the best ways to solve these problems, like you're talking about long form copywriting, Sam, 
the best copywriting books are from like the 1950s and 60s. For sure. Like those old school direct mail, like really long form business letter copywriting books are amazing. Like that and like all the core principles still hold true today, but people are like, no, nah, no, nah, that doesn't that doesn't matter. That's not nah. important today. We're doing it new and better. It's like, no, this is everything we do is a retread of what somebody else well, has already it's, figured out anyway. It's because they're based on human psychology and humans have not as much as we like to think that we have evolved. We have not evolved that much. No, no. no. We, I mean, we like to think we're special and we're not. Can I um, before we wrap up, can I just yeah. list out a bunch of resources that I use? Because I want people please, to have this. please right, we'd love I'm, that because I just happen to have it up. All right. So Facebook ad archive, just Google it. It's basically a way to see what ads different Facebook pages are running. That's important because you can figure out who's successful and you want to see what their positioning and targeting is. The second one is Moat, M-O-A-T. It's a way to see what ads people are running on Google. And finally, you can do the same with SEM Rush. So Moat is for banner ads. SEM Rush is for search ads. And you want to see the successful people, what they're targeting it is. And finally, Jungle Scout. You can see what ads... Uh, and what different type of stuff is, uh, it's an uh, like an SEO tool, but for Amazon. And then a few more tools are, I love going to Glassdoor. I like seeing what the people yes, who work at a company too. say. I like Sometimes people will say like, this company is a nightmare. Their churn is crazy. Like it's going horrible. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Maybe this isn't a great business. Or they'll say like, the business model is awesome, but like it just sucks that management is rude. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Just don't be rude and we have a cool business. <laughs> um, I, go, I go to newspapers.com. Uh, that's a it's a website owned by Ancestry.com, I believe. And it's a really cool way to look at historical newspapers. So if a company was launched pre-internet, I like to read what uh, journalists have written about it. Anything else that's interesting? I also go to a LinkedIn. So I always Google. Oh, yeah. If I find a company that's interesting, I'll Google like HubSpot, LinkedIn, sales, quota. And you'll see some guy who works there that put... I have I've always a, achieved my quota of one point five million dollars. Mm. And I'm like, oh, sick. Thanks. You you just told me like how much like what's an effective quota for a salesperson or I'll Google like LinkedIn, the hustle writer articles. And there's like a writer says like I was responsible for writing three articles a day. It's like, oh, thank you. You're telling me like how these things operate. Yeah. And then lastly, I look at crazy amounts of reviews. So anything that I'm interested in whether it's a company or a product, I Google the company name reviews Reddit, the company name reviews Amazon, the company name review Etsy. And I find what normal people or I go to iTunes and look at like what their app reviews are. I find out what normal people are saying about this and it teaches me the weaknesses and the strengths of, of a different product or service. So that's a list of some resources that people can use. That was awesome. I feel like Sam dropped a bunch of knowledge and a bunch of tools and very actionable things that we can all do. And I think one of the themes of this show is Go out and learn and just don't sit on the sidelines. Don't spend all of your time in spreadsheets. Research companies and then put ideas into motion. Test them in much smaller ways. This has been awesome, Sam. Thank you so much for joining. And until next time, it's been Marketing Against the Grain. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better. 